Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I usually run through the status of my sermon for this weekend. And so often, as it's the case, I get some of my best illustrations just right out of the communities that I'm conversing with. And in CRC Voices, I picked up this article by Julia Shears. She's a graduate of Calvin College, grew up in a not... Um, grew up in a fairly irregular CRC, I think. I haven't read her book, but she, she wrote this book, Jesus Land, a few years ago, and she just had a piece in the New York Times called Raising Children Without the Concept of Sin. My religious fundamentalist childhood, I guess that's the Christian Reformed Church, that would make me a fundamentalist, I guess, was built around the fear of sin. My daughter doesn't, my daughters don't even know the word. Uh, she graduated Calvin College, I don't know when, um, probably around the same time as me. She's probably about my age. When I look at the picture at the cover on her book, I think, yeah, we grew up at about the same time. Very different place, though. The notion of sin dominated my girlhood. Raised in Indiana by fundamentalist parents, sin was the inflexible yardstick by which I was measured. Actions, words, even thoughts weren't safe from scrutiny. The list of sinful offenses seemed infinite. Listening to secular music or watching secular TV, saying gosh or darn or geez, questioning authorities, envying a friend's rainbow array of Izod shirts. It's about my, you know, that's about when I grew up. Um, but New Jersey, we didn't do the Izod shirt so much. Um, it was flannel shirts and work boots. God was a megaphone bleeding in my ear. Very subtle reference to C.S. Lewis there. You're bad, you're bad, you're bad. I had recurring nightmares of malevolent winds tornadoing through my bedroom, a metaphor I now realize for an invisible and vindictive God. I had little contact with people outside the rigid triangle of my Calvinist home, church, and school. Weekends were busy with Calvinette activities and later young Calvinists. I feared non-Christians in general and atheists in particular because unbelievers didn't have the stick, didn't have the stick of eternal damnation hanging over their heads. They had no reason to act morally and and were therefore, I believe, com uh, capable of utter depravity. A little twist on total depravity, but that's not really what total depravity means. I lost my faith by fits and starts. The absolute truths of my girlhood crumbled when I watched Carl Sagan's 13-part Cosmos series in graduate school, a program that included an overview of evolution which made it verboten to me as a kid, but whose logic made irrefutable sense to me as an adult. And, and that paragraph is kind of like many of the conversations I have with, with Jordan Peterson followers and all the conversations I do on my channel. And after years of living a secular life, I realized that my notion of sin has evolved. As a girl, my focus was on gaining admittance to heaven. Now I believe that this life is the only life we've known, this planet our only existence. I am no longer motivated by a fear of, un of an unproven hell, but by real-world concerns about injustice and equality. So yes, she shucked off her childhood version of Christianity. Although I no longer have contact with my parents and live a very different life, we do have this in common. Just as my parents' approach to imparting their values was shaped by an effort to avoid the sins they feared, I am raising my daughters according to my moral code. Indeed you are. To me, the greatest of all sin is failing to be an engaged citizen in the world. So the lessons are about being open to others rather than closed off. And when I read that paragraph, I thought, did she forget the first sentence of the paragraph by the time she wrote the third one? It's sinking in. My daughters make me proud by taking their own actions to confront injustice when they see it, by insisting that we keep a box of protein bars in the car to hand out to homeless people at stoplights, by participating in school walkouts against gun violence, by intervening when they see kids bullied on the playground, by always questioning the world around them. I think they're ready for a Gillette commercial. As we stood in line a few weeks ago at the Dickens Fair, I realized that my daughters already knew what sin was, without ever having to been exposed to the onerous religious weight of the word. Despite being unchurched, they are empathetic, loving, and kind, and even more, they are fearless. I gazed into Davia's upturned face and felt a rush of happy love and happiness. I was raising her without sin. 
Here was a child who's recent, who recently joked that the Christmas standard, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, should be changed to I'm dreaming of a diverse Christmas. Now, I always thought white and white Christmas meant snow, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Although, you can look up what kind of a father Bing Crosby was. She did have a moral code, one she followed, not from obligation, but from her own desire to make the world a better place. A group of carolers strolled by, and she turned to watch them with a delighted smile, her question already forgotten. I leaned down and put my arm around her, watching the world from her perspective. An explanation of sin could wait. Sin. That little word. That little word. Since the 1960s, the enlightened West has imagined that saying people have this thing is a bad idea. They feel bad about themselves, and the assumed definition and the assumed definition of a good life in our culture is never having to endure the bad, never having to endure bad feelings, especially about one's own self. Well, let's take a look at this word in this story. Well, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark, and as I mentioned in some of my previous sermons, that the Gospel of Mark at about 11,000 words is quite a bit shorter than the Gospel of Luke, over 19,000 words, yet this story in the Gospel of Mark coming earlier than in Matthew and Luke is a longer version, and it's very interesting, and the, and, and the, and the story revolves around this question of sin, and the relationship between sin and all the bad things in the world. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Jesus apparently had a house in Capernaum. That's where he was living. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, now it's interesting that we're continuing this theme early in Mark of the incredible popularity of Jesus so much that he could hardly say anything or do anything because he was completely besought by the people. Now, here in verse 2, they preach the word to him. That word is logos, and it's very interesting how in Mark that that is a term, logos, which in John obviously is deeply connected to Jesus himself, that, that is connected with what Jesus preached and the message that he was preaching to the people. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the mat to the mat they lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now that's a very interesting verse. Because first of all, he's not we don't get the sense that he's looking at the faith of the paralyzed man who is about to be forgiven. In other words, this isn't a faith healing. If you think about healing being done by the faith of a person in some kind of psychosomatic way, there's something else going on here. Jesus forgives the sins of the paralyzed man by virtue of the faith exhibited by his four friends. Now, that's not going to be the focus of this sermon, but that in and of itself is something worth pondering deeply. Now, what is clear to everyone about the circumstance? Weren't we wanting him to be restored and able to walk again? That's what they're looking for. Did he come in there looking for the forgiveness of sins, especially sins the way we define it? Do they believe in a connection between sin, disability, illness, and infirmity? And what's more, did Jesus? Actually, in that day, they believed in it a lot. We find in John 9, about a man born blind, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened, now the assumption there is that neither of them sinned causing his blindness. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now this passage isn't my focus today, but I wanted to note that 
this idea that illness or infirmity or misfortune or bad things are directly caused by personal moral failures was very much an idea in that time. And here Jesus nuances it and says, no, that's not it. He was born sinful so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, right there, we have an idea that probably disturbs us. That, that God would allow these things to happen so that God himself could be revealed in the context of these things. Back to the story. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's the NIV translation. Another way to translate the Greek might be, who can forgive sins but the one God? In other words, this is blasphemy because here Jesus, this man, declared this paralytic's sins forgiven on behalf of the faith exhibited by his four friends. And they thought this in their heart. And Jesus knew what they were thinking. Now in some of the other Gospels they say it under their breath, but the point is clear. Who on earth, if you were raised in this theological context, could imagine that a mere man could declare the forgiveness of sin? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit what was, uh, what, what, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take up your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Now the Son of Man reference comes from Daniel 7, and in Daniel 7 the Son of Man, after the Ancient of Days dismantles the tyrannical imperial sea monsters that come out of the sea, the Son of Man is given an eternal kingdom. And Jesus uses this term about himself. This is the first time it's used, I believe, in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus uses this term as an, of himself as a way of signaling something to the people who had read Daniel 7 and obscuring his claims from many of the foreigners who hadn't. This obviously raises expectations, but it also forces people to think. Now, he's claiming this title for himself. He's claiming this authority for himself. And he just, in fact, did it in action by, forget, by declaring the man's sins forgiven. But now he's going to say, in fact, my authority goes beyond a pronouncement of mere words. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He took it up, he got up took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. What was Jesus saying about himself? What is the relationship between the man's paralysis and the man's sins? How could someone come in and say, Your sins are forgiven, and we think, Oh yeah, talk is cheap. But then... He walks out. What is the connection between sin and misfortune? This is an old question that has occupied almost every culture from the dawn of time. The first most common answer has been karma, which has become once again in our culture a very popular word. Do bad things and bad things will happen to you or to your children or to you in your next life if you believe in that sort of things. And this is, in fact, what Job's friends in the book of Job were pressing on him. Job, you've suffered misfortune. There must be some secret sin. That's why bad things are happening. You'll, in fact, even find this idea sported around in churches. Oh, you've got an illness. There must be a secret sin. This is kind of the first idea about the relationship between sin, as we're thinking about it here, moral fault, and misfortune in some kind of cosmic story or background. Now, in the secular age, this thing gets pulled apart. In a sense, karma is banished, unless we find a scientific causal link like smoking gives you cancer. But notice, it just keeps creeping back into the culture. You'll find it all the time. I'll find some of the most uh, hip spiritual people talking about good karma and bad karma all the time. After years, in fact, in this article, after years of living a secular life, I realized that my notion of sin had evolved. 
As a girl, my focus was on gaining acceptance to heaven. Now I believe that this life is the only life we'll know. This planet, our only existence. There's no sky daddy keeping score on our moral performance and punishing us or rewarding us. And, and that certainly that scorekeeping isn't going to be what brings us to heaven. That, in fact, is what Julia believed to be true when she was a little girl. And it's not unusual to believe that. That's a pretty common assumptions about religion, and it's very fitting with a child in terms of child development. Sin got redefined as an archaic notion in the secular age, connected with a heavenly moral accountant who will either admit you or bar you from heaven if you've got more, demer more demerits than credits accumulated. And she noted, her girl does have a moral code, and it's all about making the world a better place in this life now, and making sure as many people as possible have as many happy feelings as they can have from zero to the time you die. But here there's something funny going on, because pluralists are forgetting their own pluralism. Julia Shear's parents tried to instill in her their worldview, which Julia would eventually reject. It had the notion of sin attached to it, and that little Julia and her brother and all of them were in fact sinners. Now Julia, a mother, is just as much a missionary as her parents were, and she employs the New York Times to celebrate her achievement of doing the same thing in her daughter's life. Her parents were missionaries. She's a missionary. Her parents were sure, she's sure. But the way the pluralist script goes, pluralism is supposed to make us unsure. But somehow, her beliefs are self-evident, while her parents' beliefs, however, whatever crazy things her parents did believe, should read the book, um, they were wrong. See, now pluralism should say, now, how can we be right? Well, Julia's sure right. She's using the New York Times to proclaim her rightness. Talk is cheap, right? Which is exactly the point of this story. It's blasphemy. And Jesus says, okay, you think it's just talk? I want you to see that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Now, what is sin? Sin is missing the mark. And in fact, when we reduce sin simply to volitional moral failure, we reduce the word. In fact, the word is broader. What is the relationship between this man's paralysis and sin? Isn't it missing the mark that a man not be able to walk, run, and dance? Now, we don't know the background of his paralysis. Via John 9, we can pretty safely assume neither the man nor his parents, if he was born with paralysis, um, were responsible for the paralysis in terms of sin. That's certainly the implication of John 9. And assuming that the paralysis isn't the fault of the man for somehow being irresponsible with his body within the framework of whatever they conceived in their time, he's probably not morally responsible for the man. But Jesus looks at his friends and the determination they had to bring him to Jesus, and they say, your sins are forgiven. What on earth do you mean, Jesus, by using that language, knowing full well what everyone in the room will think? Because, of course, he would know what people would think. Everybody would understand the implications of Jesus saying those words. And you must believe that Jesus planned this whole thing all along. He was about to give them a teaching about the kind of authority he has. And he displayed it in front of them. He's not merely a wonder worker that can make lame people walk. He is the author of this world. And he has the power to bind or release, to condemn or forgive. It's his, and he expresses his authority in everything he does. Now, why do we Christians say that we are sinners? And why did Julia not want her daughter to believe she was a sinner? She wanted her daughter to believe that everything she thought was true and right, and her vision of how the world should be made better was absolutely certain, which makes everyone who doesn't share that vision a sinner. 
we recognize as Christians that we miss the mark. And we miss the mark intentionally and willfully sometimes. We call that sin. But sin pervades our lives in ways that we're not even often responsible for. Life in this world is mark missing all over the place. We recognize we even we recognize that we even in our moments when we are simply sure that we know how to make the world how to make um ugh, see this is why it's a rough draft. Sure that we know how to make a world that doesn't miss the mark, even and sometimes especially those very efforts perpetuate the mark missing we tried to eradicate. And we do it all the time. This program's going to fix something. And we discover that that program created two or three more problems. DDT was going to rid the world of insects. Then we had Silent Summer. We do this again and again and again. Now, what happens if you teach that little child that they're a sinner? Well, they might realize that they can make mistakes. What happens if you teach that little child that they are never wrong? There's no sin in them. In Genesis 3, the man and the woman are convinced that God is holding out on them, so they're going to take matters into their own hands and make the world a better place. And then one of their sons kills, kills the other. And if you read Genesis 4 and 5, the implication of the text is, this strategy is a disaster. And the misery we see in our world is a direct consequence of imagining I have no sin. You must be the sinner if you disagree with me. We only miss we not only miss the mark, but way too often we are even we are even wrong as to what mark we should be hitting. That's how bad we are at this. We actually hit the mark we thought alleviated suffering or to make the world a better place, we sooner or later realize that many of our efforts make matters worse. I was talking to, to Darren, and he's one of the conversations that I've been having with people that have been interested in Jordan Peterson, and after listening to Jordan Peterson, something happens in them, and they, they start to want to get interested in the Bible, and this guy, on a, he, was a, he was living a perfectly, perfectly lovely atheist life, certainly not thinking he was a sinner, and he bumps into a church planter and everything changes. And this is what he said to me this week, actually, about the day that um, the New York Times is publishing that piece. He said, if you had asked me a year ago, am I a good guy? I would have said yes. If you had asked the guy a year ago if he was a sinner, he'd say no. If you ask me now, I'd say no, but I'm better than I used to be. Huh. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, he can, in fact, have the moral strength to accept the label of sinner. The moral strength to accept the label of mark misser. He can have the moral strength to actually confess in public, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And all of my ideas to fix this world, they're probably mostly wrong. Well, how can you say that? Because, well, if... If you can't fix this world, who will? A little bit before that, he said, I used to regard people as obstacles. Now I can't because of Jesus. These are the kinds of people, meaning all people. These are the people he died to save. Now, Jesus heals the man and he walks. And that bit of sin as Mark missing from the walking was healed by Jesus. What did Jesus get for doing these things? Well, we killed him. In the midst of a terribly bloody culture war in the first century, when people were not simply saying bad things against each other, but knifing them in the dark, the opposing sides couldn't agree on much. But what they could agree on was that the world would be better without Jesus, and so to shut him up, they should kill him. Almost everyone believes that their agenda will make the world a better place. I've got political notions. I've got political ideas. I've got ideas about how to fix the world. And if I would, if I would share them with you, some of you would probably agree with some and disagree with others. You might call me a fool. You might call me an idiot. You might call me evil. You might call me a sinner. 
The Romans had the Roman way. The Brits had the white man's burden. The Americans have truth, justice, and the American way in both the new woke version or the old traditional version. We've all got an idea how to fix the world. Jesus comes to us and says, take up your cross and follow me. Your cross? Where does that come from? Well, Jesus will have to pick up the cross after he had received the beating and carry it to his own place of execution. And Jesus tells us to do that. Huh. What does that mean? The beginning of the Heidelberg Catechism starts like this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own. That I don't belong to me. That I am part of God's story. And that though I am a sinner, he can use people with bad ideas like me, with wrong ideas like me, whose, whose mark-missing strategies would probably make the world a worse place if you were to give me all kinds of power. But I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. Why? It starts with this confession of sin. Part of the tyranny of the devil is to make me think, I don't have a problem. No, I've got a problem. And my problems go deep. And they're hard. And if I would imagine that I could make the world right just with all kinds of money and all kinds of power, I'd probably make the world worse. He also watches over me then in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head. And you see plenty have fallen without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. That means the bad things, the hard things, the sins done against me, even the sins I do. He works them together strangely, often against my will, often against the ideas I have about how God should run the world. But I belong to him. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Well, I wish I was more wholeheartedly willing and ready. There's, there's often a whole lot of sin in me that makes me not really wholeheartedly and really quite a bit conflicted. There's a lot of sin in me. And I'm frankly happier saying I am a sinner than trying to bear the burden of imagining everyone else's. What must I know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Is that a hard thing to swallow? Yeah. But you know what's even harder to swallow? Being the perpetrator in a do-gooding effort and becoming the victimizer. I, you know, I, some of you, of course, most of you who are watching this on YouTube know I've done a lot of thinking about... Jordan Peterson over the last year, and one of the observations he makes is that so often people who suffer from post-traumatic injuries do so not so much from the trauma they've been victimized by, but the trauma they've perpetrated. And this is why I say I'm a sinner. This is why I accept that burden and responsibility. This is why if you ask me, how I can fix the world? I'll say, I can't. But I'm going to point to someone who I believe does and is in fact doing it. What must I know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. But it doesn't stop there. Second, how I am free from all my sins and misery. Oh, that sounds good. But you can't be free unless you acknowledge it. And third, how I am to thank God for such a deliverance. And that's why we have this meal. This meal is food for sinners. If you're not a sinner, you don't see any need for it. Walk on by. If you are a sinner, if you know, just as this probably apocryphal story about G.K. Chesterton, when the newspaper ran the ad, What's Wrong with the World?, G.K. G. K. writes in and says, I am. I am what's wrong with the world. I am the sinner. 
I can't manage the world. I can't even manage me. And so I turn my life over to someone who can. And he says, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. And just as I am going to give my life for you, give your life for each other. And just as the Father gave me my life back, I will give you your life back too.